Uh, I'm your moderator. I'm Angie Drobnik Holin. I'm the editor in chief of PolitiFact, the national politics fact checking website. We've been fact checking political messaging uh, since 2007, and we won the Pulitzer Prize for national reporting in 2009. Um, it's been a very interesting adventure these last few years, um, monitoring and correcting misinformation on the internet. And as a matter of disclosure, we are one of five US fact checkers who currently work with Facebook, um, debunking misinformation on that platform. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel today, so I will begin with introductions. Um, on the end, we have Camille Francois. She is the Chief Innovation Officer at Graphica, where she leads the company's team focused on detecting and mitigating disinformation, media manipulation, and harassment. Francois was previously the Principal Researcher at Jigsaw, an innovation unit at Google, that builds technology to address global security challenges. Francois has advised governments and parliamentary committees on both sides of the Atlantic on policy issues related to cybersecurity and digital rights. Ellen Weintraub has served as commissioner on the U.S. Federal Election Commission since 2002 and has served as its chair. She has been a consistent voice for campaign finance law enforcement and robust disclosure. She believes that strong and fair regulation of money in politics is important to prevent corruption and maintain the faith of the American people in their democracy. She tweets at Ellen L. Weintraub, and I'm personally a fan of her tweeting. <laughs> Then we have Susan Ness. She's a former commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission, serving from 1994 to 2001. She's a distinguished fellow at the German Marshall Fund, where she works on transatlantic digital policy issues, and at the Annenberg Public Policy Center, where she convenes the transatlantic high-level working group to address illegal and harmful content online while protecting a vibrant global internet. She is founder of Susan Ness Strategies, a communications policy consulting firm. And then finally, we have Alan Dickerson. He is legal director of the Institute for Free Speech, where he leads its nationwide litigation efforts. He has represented individuals and organizations in First Amendment challenges before the US Supreme Court, the various US Courts of Appeals, state Supreme Courts, and various trial courts. He has testified before Congress and state legislatures and regularly comments on the actions of the FEC, the IRS, the SEC, and other federal agencies. So our panel today, we're considering the question of social media amplification and democracy. It's been two years. No, that's not right. It's been four years <laughs> since the 2016 elections where nation states attempted to tamper with our democratic elections. I fact checked in real time. <laughs> it's been four years since 2016 when nation states attempted to tamper with our democratic elections using disinformation on social media. Have things gotten better or worse? Reports from the UK surrounding the December elections, the domestic special interest groups themselves may have started to employ tactics used by Russian trolls in recent elections. Meanwhile, the major social networks and lawmakers in Congress struggle to deal with how to manage political advertising. Our panel today will look at what we know and what is being done to preserve our democracy in the internet age. So I've asked our panelists to kick off the discussion today with their views of the overall landscape and to answer this question. Are things better or worse since 2016? Certainly we know a lot more than we once did. And I'd like to start with Camille. An easy question to start, huh? Um, jokes aside, I think 2016 does look like it was, you know, 20 years ago from, from that regard, because we have to recognize how flat-footed um, everyone was caught in 2016 by the foreign interference attempt. Uh, concretely, that meant that we had a lot of catching up to do, right? If you think about major social media platforms, they didn't even have terms of services that would prevent this type of activity when the first um, evidence of the Russian trolling campaign came, came on, a lot of the discussion was like, is that even okay? How do we call that? What do we do against it? Whose job is it to even do anything against that? 
And so I think in this regard, there was a lot of catching up to do. And over the past four years, um, for the major extent, we have done this catching up. Today, most uh, major social media platforms have very specific rules that would apply to this type of activity. They have very specific teams whose job it is to go and keep an eye out for this type of activity. And there is overall a much more granular picture of who are the types of actors who are conducting these influence campaigns, what does it look like, and when are all the last times in which they have done this. That leads me to the not so good news part of the answer, which is the other thing that has changed over the last four years is now there are many more actors in that game. When you think about foreign interference, um, in 2016, the debate was largely dominated by Russia. Uh, today, we know that Iran has actually been doing foreign interference campaign on social media targeting the US for a very long time. When you look at the first time the Iranian regime used social media to target American audiences, you realize it was in 2010. Uh, that gives you a sense of how much catching up we had to do. So we know Iran has been doing this, and we've seen a lot of these campaigns. They're very voluminous, they're very persistent. We've seen China do this. We've seen Saudi Arabia do this. We've seen the UAE do this. And on top of all these foreign actors, we've seen a growing market of domestic practices who are like, well, that's a good idea. We're also going to go into the game of, of disinformation. Um, we still have a lot of confusion in the terms we use amplification, foreign actors, trolling, disinformation, misinformation, a lot of that kind of gets, you know, thrown together in the kitchen sink in a way that's not particularly helpful when you want to have a structured discussion on what type of users of social media are allowed in a political campaign and who is supposed to do what and when. What, just, just to close that statement on something that I think is still very much lacking and on which we have done zero progress, we don't have a lot of rules and norms for what candidates and campaigns themselves will do in the upcoming election. We haven't seen a lot of statements from campaigns and parties and candidates saying, here's a thing I will do, here's a thing I will not do. As a result, people tend to overreact on both sides, right? A lot of candidates are using apps, for instance, that allow the supporters to collectively campaign together. And a lot of people are seeing this traffic and saying, oh my God, the Russians are back. Of course, it's not that, and perhaps it's okay to use an app to coordinate your supporters. But a lot of campaigns are also thinking, is it okay to create a bunch of fake profile and to coordinate them together to have a, a big campaign online, which is basically the definition of a troll farm, and they're not very clear answers to that. So there's good and bad in, in what happened in the, in the last uh, four years. Ellen, better or worse and why? <laughs> So the answer to the either or question is yes. Um, <laughs> actually, I think I think it is it is better. It's just not good enough. I mean, in um, just pivoting off of what Camille was just saying, in in 2016, the platforms were so clueless that Facebook was actually accepting payment in rubles for political advertising. Now you would think that would be a real big tip off but nobody was looking, nobody was paying any attention. So they are now, they're not taking foreign currency for political advertising, that's a, that's a step in the right direction. Um, but I, it's been really disappointing to me to see how little really has been done at either the legislative or the regulatory uh, uh, level. There have been innumerable bills introduced in, in Congress, None of them have really gotten anywhere. The um, uh, Congress has appropriated some more money uh, for um, securing the uh, cyber security at the state and local level, and that's a good thing, but they frankly haven't allocated enough to really do the job. Uh, I think that uh, DHS has been working with state and local governments on, on cyber security, and that's really important and a good thing. We have struggled at the FEC to even pass a regulation that would just clarify the rules on disclaimers, on political advertising, on, on the most obvious and undisputed political advertising that says vote for, vote against, or solicits campaign donations. 
Um, and we, we could not sadly get an agreement after, on, on a rulemaking that literally has been going on since 2011. Uh, and we, uh, but nobody was paying attention to it in 2011. It just didn't seem like uh, an interesting topic. We got six or seven comments back then. In, in the last couple of years, we got hundreds of thousands of comments. We, got, uh, we had a very uh, robust hearing on this, and yet uh, we still, uh, frankly, I couldn't get a lot of engagement on the other side in terms of trying to just nail down a rule. Uh, one thing that I've been very disappointed in in Congress um, is that, uh, again, there have been bipartisan bills introduced. Uh, in particular, I would highlight the Deter Act, supported by, uh, sponsored by Marco Rubio and Chris Van Hollen, that would adopt strong sanctions against any foreign government that tried to intervene in our election. Because my concern is that just as we were asleep at the switch in 2016, we, we can look for in 2020 what they did in 2016, but what are the odds that nothing new is gonna happen in 2020? It's really important that we have strong deterrence measures in place so that even if we can't detect it, at least let us deter it, let us speak with one voice as a nation to uh, basically say to the world, you know, this is the United States of America and we will not tolerate anybody mucking around in our democracy. And sadly, we can't seem to get a bill like that passed in Congress. So I think that is um, that is really unfortunate. The uh, the platforms are all coming up with their own programs, each of which is different. Twitter has uh, decided they're just not going to do political advertising, but they found that even a hard ban is harder to implement than they had originally thought, and figuring out what is the advertising that would fall into that ban uh, is uh, trickier than they had originally thought. I think Google has come up with uh, the most sophisticated approach um, uh, in terms of trying not to have these really thin slices of micro-targeted ads. They've, they've said they're not going to go down below the zip code level, uh, which I think is a real good step in the right direction. And they'll they'll also sort by gender and age. But um, uh, that seems to me a, a, to be a very productive step. My concern on micro-targeting has been that it eliminates the normal First Amendment response to the spread of false information is that you want to have counter arguments, you want to have counter speech. Well, if you don't see the information, the false information or the misleading information that is out there because it is being um, targeted with surgical precision to just those people who are most likely to be susceptible to those arguments, then uh, there's no way to counter it because you're not seeing it. So um, I have uh, advocated for um, uh, the platforms to adopt a rule against uh, their own rules against micro-targeting and uh, Google has taken some steps in that direction. But Facebook, after thinking about it, for a long time and saying they were thinking about it for a long time, they uh, came out with a policy that really doesn't make very many changes in that regard. They're doing a good job on disclaimers on their political advertising. So let me say one thing that good thing that Facebook is doing, but I think their, um, uh, uh, their, their whole model of sucking all this data out of your use of their platform and using that to micro-target ads towards you as a, as a user of that platform um, and then other people who are going to be less susceptible to those arguments, more skeptical of those arguments, don't get access to those arguments in order to counter them. I, I think that is having a, um, uh, that, that has the potential to magnify and amplify disinformation and, uh, and, and allow it to go unresponded. And I think that is uh, unfortunate. Um, and uh, I, I wish they had chosen differently. Thank you, Angie. Um, it has gotten better, and it has gotten worse. So uh, first on the better side, the, the glass half full. Uh, stakeholders are now very much aware of the issue. <clears throat> Groups have been organized to monitor uh, the digital environment for manipulation, disruption, or interference, and to monitor the platform's responses to this. Platforms have hired and trained uh, uh, both staff as well as machines to ferret out these issues um, in authentic behavior, bots, deep fakes, and the like. Not perfect, to be sure, but it takes time to get those pieces in place and perfect performance. 
Platforms have adopted new transparency regimes, also very much not perfect. Um, but nonetheless, we have something that it's not fully baked, but we have something to begin to work with. Um, greater collaboration between platforms and among platforms, as well as between platforms and governments, both in the United States and in Europe. I think that's a really good sign. They're working together, sharing information about what they're seeing out there. Um, so uh, that is uh, very much uh, a benefit. Um, and as Ellen was pointing out, some platforms have chosen to limit reach uh, and to limit the impact of political speech um, that is patently offensive or harmful or whatever. <clears throat> so those things, particularly as, as Ellen pointed out, the micro-targeting, that's something um, that is progressing and we'll see how well that works. Now on the worst side, it's gotten worse. The, as um, Camille pointed out, digital disruption techniques are now much more sophisticated. Um, it is a blend of state actors as well as local actors and very hard to detect. Uh, they are um, pushing culture wars um, much more as we saw in the United States. This is now a great tactic that's been used abroad very effectively. Looking at race, immigration, gender, climate change, they are weaponizing hatred at a uh, pace that has not uh, been, been successful previously. It's a fluid set of actors, less state, more local. Um, people now, and this is an important one to take away from this panel, people now have far less trust in their institutions. So one can say the Kremlin has been very successful in addressing that. And that is going to take a tremendous amount of effort on our part to repair that damage. Um, just some of the factoids. Um, uh, a report that was put together by ISD, which is a British uh, firm, together with a number of other NGOs, found that 200,000 fake accounts on Facebook supported AFD in Germany right up until the elections. Um, Avaz, another one of these uh, groups, uncovered far-right disinformation networks in France, UK, Germany, Spain, Italy, Poland, content that was viewed 763 million times over a three-month period uh, before it was removed by Facebook. Um, there is poor data capture and reporting, but once again, that is something people are focusing on. And again, the last takeaway from this part of the conversation, transparency is extraordinarily important. We need to be working with the platforms to get the right information out at the right in a timely fashion and more consistency across platforms so that we can compare and contrast performance. Thank you. So I'm, I think, the only practicing litigator up here. So the answer, of course, is going to be it depends. And it depends <laughs> in particular on how you're defining your terms. So I think that there's sort of three different answers I would give. Um, the first is when we're talking about foreign, so thank you, when we're talking about foreign sovereign actors, um, you know, multi-billion dollar foreign intelligence services um, with the institutional memory of the KGB, say, uh, that you are not I don't have a good answer for that for the simple reason that I'm not read in on any of those programs and I don't think any of us up here are. Uh, maybe some of you are, are who are out in the, uh, the audience. What we do know publicly is that there's been an enormous effort by the US intelligence community, by our allies, um, <clears throat> to take action on this. I mean, when you're, when you're actually putting out press releases that you took down the IRA's website, I, I'm curious what you're doing that is not public. Um, so I think that the, the, the broad evidence of how we're responding to foreign actors is that the situation is much improved, um, although I don't know the details and I suspect most of you don't either. Um, and that's probably for the best. Um, now onto the harder questions. Um, I think there's the, part of the problem is what we mean by misinformation. I think there's two different big buckets that get conflated. Uh, the first is what I think of as the easy questions. You know, you send out something saying the election isn't actually on Tuesday, it's on Wednesday. 
or you know things of that nature, verifiable, what we think of as actionable uh, claims of truth in the common law, for those of you who are lawyers. You know, yes or no questions you can give to a jury. And that, I think the situation, again, is much improved. Um, for all of the flack that Facebook has taken, they've been very clear that that sort of thing they have every intention of taking down. And that's not just a policy choice, that's an engineering choice. That's the sort of thing that you can do at scale, that you can teach a machine to recognize and to take down in a way that's useful and effective. That's also, and I think this is important, the sort of thing that does undermine trust in institutions. Um, I don't want to overstate that point because I'm always, anytime there's a reference to institutions, I'm reminded of the famous line from the Barnett case um, where Justice Jackson said that, you know, maybe we should be careful about arguments that give an unflattering appraisal of the, uh, the uh, willingness of free minds to embrace our institutions. But, you know, you, that the, those easy questions, I think the situation is much improved. Now we get to the hard questions. And I think this, this is the difficult thing, and this is where I'm going to put on my First Amendment lawyer hat. Um, a lot of things that are called misinformation are either not detectable at scale or are the subject of reasonable disagreement and opinion. And that, I think, has to be treated differently than, no, the election's actually on Wednesday instead of Tuesday, or active attempts at fraud that you would, you would think of as still prosecutable um, and actionable, even under the First Amendment. So there, I think, I think you've got a few difficult categories. Um, one, I think it's worth remembering that political rhetoric has never exactly been a gentle exercise. Um, the use of puffery and innuendo and overstatement uh, goes back. And if we're going to start saying, you know, that sort of stuff has to be taken off the web, you're going to run into difficult questions. I mean, what are we going to do about claims that the president has been compromised by Russian intelligence services? Is that coming down because it's unprovable? If a, a Democratic presidential candidate makes references to that, how are we going to act? Because you have to have a consistent set of rules on these things. Um, you know, if you want to back way up, how do we respond to a fake memo that gets put out on major networks saying that George W. Bush, you know, was, was behaved inappropriately in the Texas National Guard? Are we going to hold that until we can verify it? Are we going to allow it to go out there and be and be disputed? Um, you know, th these are the these are the hard questions that are really at the core of what we mean by disinformation. And recall that in the event, you may not know whether something's disinformation. It's not as though, you know, again, lawyer, you, when you take something to trial after extensive discovery, you've got a pretty good sense of what the facts are, at least within the epistemological universe of what people can know. But that's not where you are in, in real time. We're dealing with these things coming out in the context of a political election. And then there's even harder questions. There's claims of fact about deeply complicated things. So there, the Supreme Court heard a case called the Susan B. Anthony List case against Dry House. And in that case, Ohio had a law that said that candidates couldn't put out anything false. Shades of Facebook's decision here. There's a reason they made this decision. And the Supreme Court, these are the facts. There was a billboard. And the billboard said, uh, Congressman, I think his friend's name was Steve Dryhouse, voted for taxpayer funding for abortion. And they cited this multi-hundred page, deeply complicated act of Congress that no one actually understands except maybe 15 people. Is that a verifiable false statement? Is there any way at scale to determine whether, I don't know, the, uh, the Affordable Health Care Act does X or Y in a way that's, you know, we're comfortable saying it's misinformation if someone makes a factual claim about a universe that complex. And then finally, the next step over, there's just basic satire and joking and the fact that these things are directed at particular ways of thinking. Um, in, in conservative circles, the cause celebre has been the Babylon Bee, which is hilarious and obvious satire if you've ever been anywhere near a conservative or the rural United States, but apparently is not obvious to people who are not from that background. I am from that background, then I spent a decade in New York, so I, I get both sides of this. Um, and you know, there's people out there spending their hard-earned resources fact-checking parody sites. And you have to wonder two things. One, whether that's a good use of everyone's time and resources. And two, and I think this is important, whether that's moving anybody. I mean, all of the research is that when things are shared that are disinformation, it's shared by a, a relatively small group of long tail, non-median voters amongst themselves. And, you know, I, I, I for one, think that it's, it's a questionable, it's probably a testable proposition, but it's unlikely that when the Russians send about a bunch of memes saying, you know, congratulate Stevie Wonder on his birthday, or here's Hillary Clinton arm wrestling Jesus, that it changed any votes. You know, I, I don't doubt that was viewed millions of times, but I think it was viewed by people who already were pretty sure what they were going to do in the election. So I think there's always a cost-benefit issue here. Um, and I think for those first two buckets, we're doing a pretty good job on the cost-benefit. 
and that the further you get down that tail of political rhetoric and questionable positions of opinion, the harder it is to make a, a, a value proposition that that's, a, that's either a good idea in terms of our, our trust in our national institutions um, or that it's a good use of resources. Can I just make a quick point? Please. A quick disagreement because this one's close to my heart. It is inaccurate to say that most of the military intelligence campaign belong to the classified realm and no one knows anything about it. I think it's really important that people know that a lot of this work has been made public. A lot of this work is driven by organizations, by investigative journalists. The platforms are making a huge transparency effort and we need that. I worked seven months helping the Senate Select Intelligence Committee write a very detailed report explaining exactly what happened? Who are the different Russian institutions? How does that compare to other actors? And that transparency is fundamental because otherwise we tell people there are foreign actors who are messing up with your feeds, but we won't tell you anything about it. And don't worry, we got your back. I think that creates chaos and confusion. I think we need to encourage further transparency efforts and also helps people understand like not everything is a Russian troll. When your uncle says something stupid on Facebook, it's got nothing to do with the GRU, right? And so that level of transparency needs to be continued and encouraged and it's difficult because indeed it's very complex, subtle nuances and complex military intelligence thing. Doesn't, doesn't mean that what US Cybercom does you know, has to be put on, on, on the public place. But from the forensics aspect and from the transparency efforts that the platforms are, are doing, it's fundamental that we keep the bar high on the transparency level sharing those details. And just a very quick rejoinder. I, I don't disagree. I read the report, which was excellent work. Um, but of course, that was after the fact and that contemporary contemporaneous efforts are much more likely to be classified for good and sufficient reasons. The ones that my team founds and expose, we go through great length of detailing every forensics we found. So recently we found the Russians interfering in the UK election, uh, circulating the confidential classified U UK US trade material. And we wrote like a very in-depth report, honestly thinking no one's ever gonna go through the pain of reading this. Yes. Um, yeah, we're grateful for, for readers, but I think we, we really need to, uh, you know, c continue the openness and transparency in, in those efforts. That also helps, you know, people know, oh, well, those are the last times we saw these interference efforts. And at that stage, this is what they looked at. Again, not, not, not saying that they are not classified bits in this, but, but I, th I think the public part needs to stay public. Can I respond to something else? Yes. Uh, Alan said, um, perhaps not quite as momentous as what, what Camille was talking about. But um, I, I, and I, Alan and I frequently are on the opposite side of issues. So I think this is one where we have a lot more common ground than, than, than usual. Uh, and I would totally agree that uh, it's probably not worth a lot of effort to be um, fact checking parody sites. But on the issue of, of whether there's any real harm in, um, uh, foreign actors reaching into our society and trying to gin up um, greater disputes. I mean, there were, there were actually riots that were fomented from abroad where uh, the Russians got one group of people all ginned up and said, you meet on this side of the street because the, the guys you disagree with are gonna be on the other side of the street. And then they got the guys on the other side of the street uh, they gave them the uh, the same kind of a message from the opposite perspective. We have enough trouble on our own. I worry greatly about the increasing polarization in our society and our inability to have um, uh, civil discourse and, and try and find common ground. Uh, it is absolutely a goal of our foreign adversaries to get us at each other's throats and to make people feel that um, what, you know, to, to raise up their antenna for every slight and for uh, every reason to feel distrustful of other people who don't agree with them 100% on every issue and, and to um, foment this kind of discord. Uh, it's really, the Russians want to make democracy look dysfunctional. You know, you don't want to be part of that society because look how they can't get along and look how they're always fighting with each other and uh, and look at the violence that's going on in their society. Look how neat and orderly our nice authoritarian society is. Don't you like that better? We, we really don't, uh, I, I, I take fairly strong exception to the notice to the notion that that's not really damaging to us. And I don't think I said that. Um, 
I, I, I agree with essentially everything you said, okay, except for uh -oh. that I think, I, I think you need to get past the level of generality. I mean, what exactly was being shared that was misinformation that was driving that causal issue? Because there, I mean, look, democracy, as you say, is messy compared to an authoritarian regime. That's part of its appeal. Aristotle has a whole thing on this. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, you know, fundamentally, sometimes institutions will be better trusted if they're just better institutions. And if what you're sharing is objectively true, you know, a lot of what's driving some of these bigger debates are just lack of trust because of true information. Um, it's one thing to send out a, a, a straight, obvious, verifiable lie like, I mean, give me an example that would start a riot. That's been actionable since the common law 400 years ago. We're talking about the harder question of what happens if the Russians or, or there's plenty of domestic people who want to put <laughs> each other, you know, us at each other's throats, circulate something that's true or at least arguably true. And there's lots of stuff in that particular context, say policing around race issues, which I, I don't think you need to manufacture distrust through lies. A lot of that's just a matter of disseminating true information, and it's been our tradition as a country to allow that. Sure. Um, I was just going to move this into a slightly different realm in the sense that um, what has been effective, we saw this in 2016 and we're seeing it today. So in this sense, it has not changed. And that is the ability to get um, patently false information circulating um, uh, at scale online and then taking that and getting it into mainstream media, which is basically the big goal. And then it really circulates. Part of the issue, which has the First Amendment uh, component to it, and I don't know that it's a settled question, um, but I'm comfortable if it's done at the platform level. And that is uh, the question of um, speech versus reach. Um, the ability to, to make your points, make them online, clear them, uh, clarify, etc. But are you entitled to a megaphone? And um, actions by some of the platforms, as long as, and, and here I think this is an area of that is ripe for discussion. Um, should, the, should either law or the platforms together make those rules in terms of um, whether or not that sort of speech should be degraded or slowed down or eliminated, whatever, uh, whatever terms you want to use, or um, is that in the U.S. Uh, impinging, if it were, a law on freedom of speech? So these are some of the issues. Um, how do we protect democracy and protect our freedoms, but at the same time, trying to address some of the harmful but not illegal speech. So I think I have time for one question before I go to audience questions. I do want to get the audience in here. So let me let me lay out this scenario for you. What I'm hearing is we have many platforms with many policies. Um, one of the big trends that we have noticed at PolitiFact over the years is that the most powerful um, uh, sticky messages of the campaign are no longer TV ads put out by the campaigns. They tend to be viral moments that are being spread online, and they're not even necessarily advertising. They tend to be content. So if our uh, government, I would say it's pretty safe to say the Trump administration has no interest in regulation. Um, Congress is unable or unwilling to pass legislation. We're not going to see any sort of regulatory response from the government, even if it were appropriate. And in the case of content, there are good arguments that it's not appropriate. So nothing is being done here. Europe, on the other hand, has a much more aggressive stance towards all of these issues. So due to lack of government action in the US, if anyone wants to refute that, I'm fine. I think I'm pretty safe there. <laughs> are we going to end up being governed by the policies of Europe, or are we just in the wild west of information where anything goes? Who wants to tackle first? <laughs> OK. Um, yes. Uh, Europe is moving fairly rapidly on this. <clears throat> 
um, in the run-up to the um, European elections last year. They put in place a number of policies and um, voluntary agreements with platforms. Uh, and I say that uh, because it was under, certainly under the threat of regulation, continues to be. Um, but um, the code of practice does have, and, and this applies to disinformation. That is uh, information or content that uh, may be harmful, but not illegal. There are other rules that govern uh, specific illegal hate speech and the like. But with respect to disinformation, each of the platforms um, at a, an accelerated pace had to come up with various um, promises to do X, Y, and Z, and then uh, had a component of transparency and review. Um, they are still working together on these issues. Um, there may very well be legislation at the end of this, but because the internet is global, um, I think it's safe to say that uh, much of what Europe does, uh, or the European Commission does, um, will uh, impact what, uh, what happens in the United States, or at least what we see or don't see. There, you can cordon off things um, by country, and they do, but nonetheless, um, a lot of the um, systems that are being put in place now um, will apply to U.S. content as well as European. I can take a rapid but very boring answer to that question. Um, Susan and I, and I work together on a transnational working group that looks at how both uh, sides of the Atlantic tackle the issue. One of the things that we've made is a framework that breaks down the different sub-problems in disinformation. I think a lot of people want to think that disinformation is one problem, it's got one shape, therefore there's one actor somewhere that's going to come up with one solution. We call it ABC, A is for actor. Sometimes the main vector of information is simply who is behind the campaign, right? Perhaps the Russian trolls are using one account manned by one person and are disseminating content that's absolutely fine, okay, beautiful content you would agree with, but the problem that makes it a problem is that they are Russians trying to uh, pass for Americans. A, sometimes it's just the actor. B, behavior. Sometimes it's simply that the campaign is run by normal Americans disseminates normal content, but is using a series of techniques that make the receiver believe that the campaign is so much more viral or so much more popular than it actually is. If you think about B, right, the world of bots and all the, the inorganic amplification techniques that you can use, it's not as much of a cybersecurity problem as what actors represent. It's almost more of a consumer protection, right? Like here you're just looking at fraud on behavior and C, finally, is the last leg, content. Sometimes, indeed, you have disinformation content. Perhaps it's a deep fake, that's a video that's designed to make you believe something that's not, but it's actually pretty rare. We focus a lot of content and on regulating content, which is where we encounter all this tricky freedom of expression issues, but a lot of the campaigns, their main vectors are either actors or behavior. Most of the content in disinformation campaign is actually stuff you would agree with. Trust me, I look at a lot of that. Sometimes I find myself in deep, happy like agreement with super wacky foreign interference campaign content, which is a very displeasing feeling. But content, small minor part, a lot of the regulations are over-indexing on this part, and we should think about all the other aspects of the problem that we can tackle with different regulatory instruments. Sorry for the boring ABC. Thanks. So questions from the audience, uh, sir, right here. Ellen, you talked about the, the need for micro-targeted political ads to be visible to people that can counter them. That, that's a really intriguing idea. And part of your solution was don't allow the micro-micro-targeting because people that would counter it might not see it. So I would ask you, since you did point out Facebook, I'm aware that their ad, their ad visibility program would let you see every political ad that's ever run and then who ran it and who saw it. Isn't that a better way than hoping you'll have people in every zip code you can find? 
there, there's two different aspects to the pro, to the way that Facebook is looking at this. Who gets the ad, and then uh, this ad library con, uh, concept. And the problem, the reason why the ad library doesn't solve it is a researchers have really been they they say they're going to improve it, but researchers have been complaining that their ad library is not user friendly, and it's hard to um, uh, it's hard to get into that database and figure out really who's seeing what. Um, now they could, that's, that seems like that's a solvable problem uh, and they say they're taking steps to solve it and we'll see whether that happens. But given the way uh, the Facebook advertising model where there are so many different iterations of every ad for this specific purpose of trying to find the perfect ad for you, um, that it's just going to overwhelm researchers. It's, it's, I, I don't know how anybody is going to get, even if they had the, the most accessible ad database, I don't, I don't know how anybody could really grapple with millions of ads and uh, each one a little bit different than, than the next one that are, are being run. So I'm not sure that that is a that there is a practical way to use that. It's good that it's there. I'm always in favor of transparency measures, but I'm not sure that that is going to solve the problem. I'll bring the back to this room. Uh, yeah, on the same question um, of what to do about targeted ads that are deceptive, uh, you're right, disclosure doesn't do much good, but how about in the case where a candidate sends a, a targeted ad to his audience, giving the opposing candidate the right to target exactly the same audience. They have an interest in getting a counter message out. You don't have to give them the names of the people, the social media company knows who it was, but to give them the right to deliver a message to the same audience, and that corrects the mistakes that were in the initial one. That, that's not a bad idea, because that allows for the counter speech. Up here in the front. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Many, many thanks for the really good conversation and highly pertinent conversation. But I, I wonder how you think about uh, when you take from the user perspective, what role of the user authentication or identification of the user could, could play in, in putting back a bit of responsibility when I go online and, and how I behave online? Is this something you have been looking into? I mean, I, I can try it. I, I don't want to look like I'm avoiding your questions, the issue. Um, so, so I guess a couple things. One is, it goes back to the scale problem, but it's a different scale problem. And, you know, and this is where I'm just going to put on my usual political regulation hat. It is unquestionably true that a presidential level campaign can abide by these sort of verification ways in a way that small grassroots organizations cannot. Um, there's, a, there's a line in Citizens United, don't worry, it didn't affect the outcome, it's just a line, um, where, you know, just as Kennedy said, you need to worry about regulating the speaker because oftentimes that's cover for regulating the message. And my worry about that sort of approach is just a transactional cost basic economics approach, which is that the cost of a two-person $500 operation in some congressional district in Iowa um, of that sort of approach is so much greater practically than it is for a presidential campaign. And a lot of my worry is that policy ideas like that, that are driven by this idea that large organizations with resources should be accountable, just don't scale down very well to, to grassroots activity. And, and I think most of us are in the business of trying to protect that sort of activity. Um, so it's not really an answer, but it's, it's a worry about getting that balance right. Many thanks for the very interesting discussion. Um, I had a question for you. I was very intrigued by your proposition that there are two types of misinformation that we can gather. And given that a larger body of research is now finding that this information increasingly sways older Americans who are the ones who are most invested and most likely to turn out, where do you draw the line between the different types of misinformation? So for example, I saw an ad yesterday about Joe Biden being investigated by the FBI for allegations for Ukraine. Can you draw a line with something that seems blatantly false but could be true? So I actually have 65 plus written down here as, as one of my notes, because you're right. I mean, there's lots of research that a lot of this mm -hmm. is being directed. Um, if not directed, at least more widely shared and believed. Um, and that this is a reason for some confidence, you know, that the, the generations coming up are very savvy and not really swung by this stuff. Um, I like your example, and, and I'm going to use it. I don't think on that example, 
I mean, I think if you're saying, you know, your precinct is this or your, the, the election is this or that date, I think you run into real problems because that sort of thing, Joe Biden's being investigated by the FBI, I have no idea. Do you know? Is that a disprovable question? Um, you know, they, they don't exactly publicize who they've got a grand jury on. Um, these things get leaked. Traditionally, American camp political campaigns have had all sorts of things that went along those lines. I mean, uh, John Edwards got blown up because someone leaked the fact that he was, you know, having an affair with someone on his campaign. That wasn't a provable fact when it first came out through, you know, some, some organization. Um, so my worry is that you're, you're backing into one of those, those harder questions um, and that a lot of what's directed at, so I, I guess in terms of the verifiable verifiability of the information, it doesn't really matter who you're targeting it to. To the extent that older people are more likely to believe stuff that's not well resourced, it may be because they remember Watergate and they remember how you know, political campaigns have always been run on innuendo, much of which turned out to be true. And if we create a lot of rules that disincentivize that process, there's gonna be some, there's gonna definitely be some upsides. Um, there, there's lots of character assassination that goes on that's horrible. Um, but it's also gonna make it much harder to have that, that sort of informal process where something hits the news and then there's a big investigation and three weeks later we find out it was true. What about actors? If I could ask a follow-up question. Neil was talking about actors and what if we found out the Russians were the ones disseminating that information? What then? Can we impose something that would fact check the sources of information that we see on the internet? If it came from a foreign source, probably constitutionally. But again, I don't know if you could do that at scale. But can I ask the rest of the panel to react to this idea of a, uh, I, I think there is this idea that older Americans are more vulnerable to misinformation. We've, PolitiFact is part of the Pointer Institute. We've also been very active in seeing teens being very vulnerable to misinformation. Efforts going. So I just want to trouble the idea that it's a, a problem that's going to go away when the older generation passes on. Um, but what about the question of, of different populations being vulnerable to, dip, to misinformation, different types of misinformation? Something. Um, unfortunately, there's actually not a lot of serious research on this. There are a few papers that are great, including the one that you referenced, which talks about, indeed, 65 plus vulnerability to misinformation. The main difficulty here is how do you define misinformation and therefore what are you measuring, right? Uh, different age groups will have different definitions of uh, misinformation, will answer questions differently. And the other thing is the different platforms will also carry different effects. So something that's often discussed as a major under-research area is email-based communication, sharing falsehoods. But again, I think a little bit of that is a red herring um, in a sense that I don't know who wants an internet of facts, right? I think people can mostly agree that it's okay to lie on the internet, uh, that we will not get that genie back in the bottle. People will do it for fun. People will do it for malice. Uh, and we will continue to have on the internet a bunch of uh, crap. The question becomes, indeed, are we able to have an understanding of when this is problematic for electoral integrity? Do we have an understanding of who are the actors who are weaponizing these, uh, um, you know, the, these features of our public discussion? And how is deception organized and being taken advantage of? When you have a deceptive campaign with an apparatus that's there to trick uh, users and consumers at scale, that's a different problem than, again, your uncle said something stupid and he should have known better and now there's a viral email thread and all is. Uh, 65 plus uh, friends are, are forwarding it around. Uh, but I think it's a great question. Yeah, you know, I wonder if the panel is aware of a browser extension called NewsGuard uh, that comes out of New York, uh, which is a bunch of, uh, actually, it was founded by two former Wall Street journalists. <laughs> now have a, a large team of, of trained journalists who review websites that are according to the new sites. And they give a green or a red label to them, and there's a nutrition label if you uh, roll your mouse over it. Is that something that it's kind of a combination of technology and human review? Do you think that has some uh, legs and is something we should all be supporting? I've actually used NewsGuard. Uh, yeah, NewsGuard, it's a very interesting product. Um, I would encourage, if you're interested in this area, to try it. Uh, you load it as a browser extension. They have a, a rubric for. Um, uh, valid, authoritative, credible news sites, and you can you can you can look through it quickly and see does this meet, does this website meet its rubric and where does it fall short? 
um, it does seem to have a problem of, of scale. You have to go to the you have to go to the website and download the extension. But I do think Newsmatch is a um, NewsGuard is a good product, and there's some other ones that are being developed. But it but it's a matter of catching on. And one thing that I have found in the misinformation space is your everyday user is exceptionally lazy. And to ask them to go and do these extra steps is very challenging. And it's, it's not just a question of being lazy, it's also a question of trust. Um, a, it does, I, I, I applaud the effort uh, of NewsGuard and other similar uh, fact checking and um, uh, verifying organizations, but first you got to get people to download the browser. They have to know about it. Then they have to download the browser extension. Uh, and they have to be amenable to uh, hearing what NewsGuard is telling them. They have to have trust in the institution that they're going to get a fair and unbiased um, fact check of these different sources. And you know who's included. This is this is a topic that I've been um, uh, interested in. Is you know who get who gets to do the fact checking, and do you trust the people who are doing the fact checking? Uh, in fact, do you trust any media whatsoever? Uh, I, I think that, um, and I don't, I don't mean you in particular, obviously, but I, I think this is uh, this points to a much broader problem in our society of uh, people not trusting media. I, I, I have to say, I, I do have some nostalgia for the days when everybody listened to Walter Cronkite and um, uh, and. And everybody at least started with the same frame of reference. And then they could have different views, but at least they started from the same facts. And we seem to have reached the point where people don't even accept the same set of facts. And if you don't accept the same set of facts, then uh, if you don't agree on what is true, then how do you come to agreements on what is the best way to address various policy uh, problems that are uh, facing our country if you can't even agree on what the problem is in the first place. So. The other issue is that smaller uh, publications um, are not part of this piece and therefore almost by assumption are not trustworthy, which is a, which is a real problem for the smaller um, newsletters and the like. I think we have time for one last question in the back. Um, so I agree with Camille, most of us probably are fine with and even prefer any of crap, um, but I don't know that everyone agrees. Certainly the Chinese seem to want a much more controlled internet. And even the UK, <clears throat> most people here will know, released an online harms white paper last year, so it creates a regulatory framework that would create an overarching duty of care um, that would apply to various silos of harmful content, including disinformation. Um, and I'm, I'm very concerned about, I, I see the attractiveness of trying to put a single regulatory architecture in place to deal with hate speech and extremist content and all of these various online harms. Um, I think disinformation is fundamentally different from some of those other areas. And I, I want to test that proposition with this panel um, because I also worry that Europe, the European Union with the Digital Services Act and others may be tempted to sort of go down a similar path. And so even if we don't necessarily agree whether you know, disinformation should be regulated or not. Hopefully we can all agree that we should, to the extent we regulate disinformation, do it specifically and uniquely and not try and put some overarching framework in place that would address disinformation in the same way as hate speech or extremist content or other harmful content. Yeah, very quickly, I think that that is a great point. It is indeed, a, you know, the, the our commitment to having free speech on the internet and everything that comes with it is not one that's shared universally. Um, specifically thinking about Europe, what's really interesting is when those conversations get focused on sub uh, disciplines and field, the conversations happening around the impact of disinformation on health and what is health disinformation, what's the difference between health disinformation what's, and health misinformation, what to do about it, what is the role of fact checking in health is really interesting. I think this is spaces that we can observe because if we can find a solution for those specifically well-contained, well-charted uh, fields, then, then indeed uh, there is a way forward. But even then, it's extraordinarily complicated. Um, yeah. I. And if I could respond, I know that the the responses to the responses to the white paper are due out uh, within a 
the next week or so. And on the 4th of February, GMF is doing a roundtable uh, that we are hosting with um, Damian Collins, who is the chair of the, or at least has been, and I assume will continue to be the chair of the select committee that's been investigating this. Um, and if anyone is interested in coming to the round table, please just give me your card and note on the back of it, and I'll see that you have an invitation. Um, but uh, from what I understand, they're gonna be looking at least initially at um, what is clearly illegal speech um, and setting aside for the moment uh, the harmful but not illegal piece of it because it is too complicated. And I think my large view would, would follow that. I mean, the laws of supply and demand are not being repealed in this space. Um, and the larger you make the aperture of regulation, the more necessary in a world of, of scarcity will be decision calls by the government and by actors on what they will and will not enforce. And I don't think it takes a lot of creativity to see the danger of that, specifically in, in the context of, of electoral speech. Ellen, final thought? Well, I just want to be clear that I don't, I don't think that any of us want to see our government taking on the role of um, being the arbiter of truth. You know, it's, it's, you know this, is, this is a question that, that has come up uh, in a variety of contexts. We don't want, you know, the platforms don't want to be the arbiter of truth either, frankly, which is why they're kind of offloading it to uh, outside fact checkers uh, and, um, you know, and perhaps groups like NewsGuard. Uh, and I think that's appropriate. I think, you know, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to have it all packaged up into one person or entity where, you know, that person is going to be making the decisions and implementing the decisions and enforcing the decisions about um, what is and isn't true. Um, when, when I was in private practice um, as a political lawyer, we would um, sometimes see advertisements that uh, w there was, you know, we had like a form letter that we would send out to um, broadcasters and newspapers saying, that's a terrible ad, please take it down. You know, when we would see ads that, um, that our clients were upset about. Uh, and uh, usually it was, uh, uh, often those ads were run by, you know, dark money groups or, or outside spending groups because they did all the political hit jobs so the candidates could look above it all. Uh, and usually the, you know, the broadcasters of the newspapers, they just chuck it in the, in, the, in the trash. And we knew they were gonna do that. But every so often things, something would be so egregious that they actually would respond and, and would take it down and and I would like to see some something akin to that evolve online because you know that strikes me as the right call you don't you don't want to get into the you know trying to figure out is this fact true is this particular line is that fact is that opinion is that puffery I mean obviously there's going to be puffery what Alan said about how this goes back to the you know the 1700s is absolutely true uh, but some things are just egregiously untrue, egregiously harmful, and um, there there ought to be some mechanism. Uh, and I'm not volunteering to do this at the FEC, <laughs> but there there ought to be some mechanism for addressing that level of uh, uh, untruth and and harm to our society. All right, Alan Dickerson, Susan Ness, Ellen Weintraub, Neil Francois, thank you so much.